last year Gregory from the channel Neoscribe asked me to make a few renders of the HMS Endeavour for a video he was making about Captain Cook. All this stuff's just been tucked away on my hard drive since last June, so I thought it'd be fun to dig it out and take a look at how it was all put together and maybe remaster a few shots. Before we jump in and say what state this blend file's in, I just want to say a quick thank you to Nvidia and Scan for sponsoring this video. As you can probably imagine, I get loads of people asking my advice about what sort of equipment they should buy for apps like Blender. Even if you're quite knowledgeable about computers, there's quite a lot of factors to account for when you're trying to make creative work. That's why Nvidia made the RTX Studio program. It's an initiative that certifies devices for creative workflows in apps like Blender, Photoshop and Premiere. In order to display the RTX Studio branding, devices have to meet a strict set of criteria and Nvidia puts each device through a series of tests to make sure that it'll deliver excellent performance. Scan has a great range of RTX Studio devices, whether you're looking for a laptop or a desktop machine. I've personally trusted Scan for many years to buy my PC equipment. I rate them very highly. You should check out the link in the description to see Scan's whole range of RTX Studio devices. So looking at this blend file, the first thing I notice is that it's incredibly noisy. Interior scenes have an awful lot of bounce lighting, which tends to produce a lot of noise. When I made this scene, I had a brand new Ryzen 2700X, which is a very fast CPU, but I still remember it being a real pain to work with this scene just because of all the noise. So let's switch over straight away to GPU render mode so I can actually take advantage of optics. And I'll also enable optics viewport denoising too. That quickly clears up most of the noise and we can get a better idea of what we're doing. We do have some pink textures over here on the flagpoles, which means that I've either moved or deleted some of the textures at some point. Blender can actually automatically search your computer for missing files if you've moved them somewhere else, although it is quite a slow process unless you can tell Blender roughly where the file's located. I think these candles are pretty nice. They're from an old Harry Potter video I made a while back. I just reused them for this scene. The flame is just a picture of some fire on a plane with an emission material. The problem with this method is that the illusion breaks if you look around the candle from the side. But there is a nice easy fix for this, you can just duplicate the flame image, rotate it around 90 degrees and it should look good from pretty much every angle unless you get really close. To make the background of this transparent I just mixed the texture with the transparent shader and I used the texture itself as a mix factor. Since it's a flame on a black background you can just crunch the values with the colour ramp until it all goes transparent when it's black. The candle also has some subsurface scattering to give it that semi-translucent waxy look. But you can see there's some weird colours like blues and greens especially near the base. This happens because by default SSS values are optimised for human skin tones. You can alter the SSS radius to change how the colours behave with SSS shaders. Just try a few random values until it starts to look good. So I messed around with this scene for a while and every time I switched over to rendered view, Blender took a really long time to load everything up. I thought that was weird because this isn't a very heavy file with loads of polygons or anything like that. So I was looking through some of the old screen recordings of when I made this thing and eventually I found the culprit. For some stupid reason I used adaptive subdivision and a displacement map for the floor. Adaptive subdiv can be great at times but it is really computationally heavy and this floor is hardly visible so it's a pretty dumb decision to use it here. So I just removed the adaptive subdiv and I manually placed a few loop cuts along the floorboard cracks instead. If you've watched my old videos you've probably seen me do this a million times by now. Then I just bevel the cracks with Control b and I push them down a little bit with the extrude tool just to give them those nice gaps in the floorboard. I hated the wood material on this trunk in the corner when I made it and I still hate it now, it's going to have to die. So I'm just going to go into the shader for this material and delete all the textures I made. I think I made this in Substance Painter. And I'm just going to bring in this image texture instead of some wood. I'm going to drag that in and I'm not too worried about the UV map which won't match at all. Instead I'm just going to cube project this thing. It's pretty much a box cube projects built for this sort of stuff. Then we can use the same material again and run that through a bump node just to give us a little bit of bump. And I also like to turn the specularity down when I use photo textures as well. I think it looks better 90% of the time. So for the roughness of materials like this, what I always used to do is I would just plug a noise texture or a musgrave into a colour ramp and then I would plug that into the roughness. But these days I prefer to use something like a concrete photograph or grunge 
or in this case some scratched metal just to make a little bit of randomness in the noise. It looks a little bit better I think than the procedural textures. So at this point I realised that the bootcase in the corner was actually backwards for some reason. I can't tell if it's backwards in the renders or not, I think it probably is and somehow I just missed it, but obviously I just needed to flip that around the right way. So next up I started working on the lighting. In the original render, I went for this very broad, flat, bright lighting, almost like you would see on a museum exhibit so you can see the whole of the exhibit. I wanted to show off this scene since it was going to be used in an educational video. This time around, I wanted to go for something a little bit more stylized, for lack of a better term. So the original lighting setup was very busy. There's an aerial light and two spotlights above the table. There's a few lights at ground level just to take some of the darkness out of the shadows and there's actually one under the table just to make the table stand out a little bit from the floor. There's a few lights in the back rooms and finally there's a spotlight just outside the windows shining to give a little bit of light onto the back wall. So I added all those lights to a separate collection which I disabled and then I started basically from scratch on the lights. I tried this kind of moonlight setup, I tried a really strong directional light, I tried all sorts of stuff but I couldn't really get something I was happy with, so I decided just to move on and try something else for now. I think that's pretty good advice in general when you're working on anything creative, just move on if you're stuck on a problem and come back to it later. It's surprising how often the solution jumps out at you when you haven't looked at something for a long time, whereas if you're just working at the problem and trying different things again and again, often you miss the really obvious stuff. I thought that the brightness of the white wall paint was a little bit distracting so I just added in some grunge by mixing a noise node with a colour ramp set to a slightly darker colour and that just gives a little bit of patchiness and some randomness to the walls and makes them look a little bit less clean. So if we take off viewport denoising we can see there's a lot of noise including some fireflies in this scene. So I went down to the light path menu and I started just optimising some of the settings a little bit so we get some cleaner renders. The Optics Denoiser does a really fantastic job of cleaning up noise 90% of the time, but anything you can do to make the denoiser's job a little bit easier will give you better, more accurate results, and you'll get faster render times too, so it's always worth spending a bit of time. I did a video recently on how to improve renders, and there's a whole section in there about reducing noise, I'll link that in the description. It's worth taking a look if you haven't seen it already. I always thought this tablecloth looked a little bit crap, so that's definitely something I want to work on some more. There's no actual table under there because you can't see where the legs would be anyway, the chairs are kind of in the way. So I originally made this just by running a cloth simulation, dropping it on a cube and then I deleted the cube. But I always thought there should be some more details in the cloth, now I actually know how to do that. So if we go into edit mode here, luckily I already have the top of it selected, so I can just add that selection to a vertex group. Then once I add the cloth simulation again, I can set the shape, pin group, as the vertex group I just made. And what that basically does is it means that when the cloth simulation runs, anything that's in that pin group on the top won't be affected, that'll just stay flat. So if you've ever tried to add some more wrinkles into a hanging cloth like this, this is how you've probably done it. You add a cube and you give it a collision property, and then you set some keyframes so that while the cloth simulation is running, the cube moves through it, and that should add some more wrinkles to it, right? But what you probably found is, no, it doesn't. It looks pants, it just doesn't work at all the cloth kind of bounces back to exactly where it was, or it kind of gets caught up on itself. So there's a better way of doing this. If you go into the cloth simulation settings, underneath shape, there's a value called shrinkage. If you move this value down just slightly and you play the simulation again, you'll get all these nice folds and wrinkles in the cloth, because the cloth is allowed to sag a little bit more than it would be by default. If you turn that value the other way, by the way, it becomes almost like an elastic material, like a latex or something, where it'll spring back on itself. The original cloth texture that I made looked really poor as well, so I knew I wanted to swap that out. I just added a noise texture originally and plugged it into the bump. I don't know what I was thinking, it looked rubbish. So I added a PBR texture set as well, apart from the base colour, which I didn't need. I usually add a little bit of transmission to cloth, since most fabrics do let some light through. I always give cloth a sheen value as well. You can see what sheen does here, it basically replicates the look of light catching thousands of little fuzzy bits of fabric strands on the surface of the cloth. So there is a replica of HMS Endeavour, a full size replica, and in the captain's room there they have this green tablecloth. Now, I don't know if that's historically accurate or whether somebody just happened to go down to Home Bargains and that was like the tablecloth colour they bought, 
but it always has kind of bugged me that it might be a mistake in the render, so I decided to change the colour to green to match. Now, like I said, usually I add transmission value to all cloth materials so the light shines through them a little bit, but I forgot that in this case there's actually a light underneath the table, so that's causing this kind of weird effect where you can see some light shining through, so I just got rid of the transmission this time. So by this point I decided that the light I wanted to go for was that really strong morning light that teams through the window. You know the kind that always happens when you have a bad hangover and the last thing you want is loads of sun in the room? So I found the best way to do that was actually to swap out the sun lamp that I was using for a HDR image of a really low sun in the sky. So that way the sun would shoot straight through the windows and hit the back wall. It gives you this really nice effect. So before I re-rendered all this out I enabled the mist pass. In the render pass setting of the shading drop down menu, you can actually view the mist pass and see how it'll look. Then I can just go in and alter the distance values of where the mist will start and where the mist will finish. In this case, I want it to start just next to the camera and I want the back of the fog to be at the back of the room. So once that scene's finished rendering, I can hop over to the compositing tab and I can use the mist pass as the factor of the mix node. Into the top of the mix node, I'm gonna plug in the render and in the bottom, I'm gonna set a nice warm color. Then I can use a colour ramp to adjust where the atmosphere gets applied, I can set the thickness and I can set how distant it can get. So the original shots looked a little something like this. I originally intended to render out just a few still images, but the power of my new workstation combined with Nvidia's Optics rendering and Cycles X makes it a total breeze to render out animations and I'm, frankly I'm doing it every time I make a scene now. So I animated the camera a little bit and I churned out an animation which looks like this. Overall I'm pretty happy with the final result. I wasn't really aiming to improve on the original necessarily. I was just trying to go back, fix a few issues that always bugged me about the original and maybe try getting a different atmosphere from the shot. Thanks very much for watching this video and thank you very much to Nvidia and Scan for making it possible. Remember to check out the link in the description to view Scan's whole range of RTX Studio devices.